So, uh, I'll start by just telling you how I got into HIV research. Um, it was in the early 80s, and I was in college, and there was this epidemic, and it really involved mostly homosexual young men, and they were dying of strange infections, opportunistic infections that most people can handle without any problem. And the only thing we knew was their CD4 count was plummeting. And that was enough that when I went to study my, for a PhD at Rockefeller University, I knew I wanted to work on immune cells. And the choice was obvious because Ralph Steinman was there. And he was studying this new white blood cell that he had identified called the dendritic cell. And everything was super exciting. Um, he uh, had really rocked the boat by saying this new cell existed that we didn't even know about. And it had a really important role in that it activated T cells. And that was kind of exciting to me because I understood that this AIDS epidemic was something was wrong with the T cells. Uh, so anyway, um, I joined his lab. It was really exciting. There were many, many smart people in the laboratory. I had the good fortune to work directly under Nina Bardlaj, who became important both in vaccine and HIV research. And we got to isolate these dendritic cells straight from blood using this new technique called cell sorting. And uh, every day we were learning new things. So it, it was really a dream job. Uh, except I got the blood to isolate the dendritic cells at around 3 p.m. And that generally meant it was uh, about 3 a.m. by the time I had isolated cells. So these cells are super rare, and we were just learning how to work with them. So it was super hard to work with them. Simultaneously, we were starting to learn that there was a virus called HIV that caused AIDS. And we understood that HIV bound to CD4 on the T cells, and that this was somehow really important in the process. So I was working on dendritic cells, and I found they had CD4. So of course, my back project that I didn't tell your boss about was to try to infect them with HIV. And I was doing it all the time, and I never succeeded in infecting them. I never published the results. And uh, I learned a really important lesson because it turned out it was really important that these cells couldn't be infected. It turned out they had a restriction factor that made them resistant. But in any case, it inspired me to, for my postdoc, move on and work with a retrovirologist. And so I found at the University of Pennsylvania a man named Michael Malin, who is one of the best retrovirologists out there. And again, I had a really exciting time in his lab. And my intention was that he was going to teach me how to infect T cells, and then I was going to go work on dendritic cells. Well, funny enough, it's 20 years later, and I haven't really mastered T cell infection. <laughs> so I'm still working on how to infect T cells. But it ended up being really interesting and important because these T cells turned out to be a reservoir for HIV. Uh, so before I go on to talk about my uh, own personal research in HIV, I just wanted to say uh, one thing that I really learned uh, from Ralph Steinman, one of my mentors. I was really lucky, I had many good mentors. And uh, it really revolved around the word dogma. And whenever he used the word dogma, he would have a twinkle in his eye, and he would be challenging us to see if our results agreed with the dogma. And he was just such an excellent mentor because he never thought we should believe something because we read it. He thought we should believe something because our data told us it, and that we should keep re-evaluating our data. And I thought it was a very lovely thing that, that he passed on to his um, students. So to start, I am going to show you a little bit of data. It's really all virtual. 
number one. Uh, and this is just to explain why in the early 80s, when you were diagnosed with HIV, you had a death sentence. Within 10 years, you were going to die. And that's shown by this time course. So here I show you the CE4 count in blue and in red is the viral load over time. And the point is, as in any viral infection, there's acute viremia. The immune response kicks in, and the viremia should go away, but it didn't go away. It persisted. And it seems okay. This pretty much the virus is just there, except insidiously, over time, the virus <coughs> is increasing. And eventually, it's increasing very rapidly. Simultaneously, the CD4 counts are slowly first and eventually rapidly decreasing. And when the CD4 count hit 200, that was generally when people showed up in the emergency room with these opportunistic infections. So, things got better. In the 90s, a bunch of chemists developed a lot of great drugs that blocked at least three steps in the viral life cycle. And when these drugs were given to patients, the viral load dropped dramatically to undetectable levels. Within weeks, logarithms of the virus were cleared. And it was so exciting. There were two men who led groups, one was David Ho in New York and George Shaw at University of Alabama. They were famous, immediately famous. One of them was Time Man of the Year because we thought we cured HIV. Of course, you all know we didn't because a few patients would eventually try to stop taking their antivirals and the virus always came back. This was a bit of a depressing piece of news. We shouldn't be so depressed. This is why we should invest in science. I mean, we converted HIV from a death sentence to a chronic disease. Nonetheless, we were depressed because we like to cure things. And there were some famous scientists, Bob Salcano at Hopkins, Joe Wong, Doug Richmond in California, who demonstrated why we couldn't cure HIV. And what they showed was that when you isolated a certain subset of T cells that are called quiescent T cells, the ones that are not metabolically active, you don't release any virus. But if you then activate the heck out of them, and convert them into a metabolically active cell that divides, virus is released. And they developed an assay that allowed them to quantitate that. And when they did that, they found that over a span of eight years, there was no change. So that was kind of depressing. But really, within that data, there were clues. Because the resting quiescent metabolically, you know, inactive cells, that was the clue. There was something different about those cells compared to the activated T cells. So optimism picked up with uh, three, three sort of experiments in nature. The first is referred to as the Berlin patient. The second is the Mississippi baby. And the third are a group of normal individuals uh, who are called elite controllers. So the Berlin patient was the one you may have heard about. He was cured of HIV by a bone marrow transplant. And I don't think it's important that I discuss how that worked because we're not going to give everybody allogeneic bone marrow transplants. That kills, you know, 20% of people right up front. It's just the fact that this guy needed one and was cured. That's exciting because we then knew it was possible. And then there's the Mississippi baby, uh, a baby who was born and immediately got antiretrovirals and got them for a period of time and then was lost to follow up. When they found her a couple years later, they found actually she didn't have any virus. And they said, huh. You may know they waited until she was about four and then the virus did come back. So we didn't cure her, but it meant that early treatment can reduce the reservoir. And so, again, it inspired us that we can do more. I think, more importantly, 
we now recognize there's a group of patients called elite controllers, and these patients, they can control the virus without antiretroviral therapy. They do it because their immune system works better than the typical patient. So that means that if we can figure out why, we should be able to help patients with HIV, maybe cure it. So with that in mind, in my laboratory, our approach is to basically compare these metabolically inactive resting cells to the activated cells. And the way we do it is we basically just take T cells that are quiescent and T cells that are activated from either normal donors, sometimes from HIV infected individuals. When we take normal donors, we infect them with virus, and then we just look to see what happens. And the big contribution from my laboratory was that actually the resting cell was getting infected. Um, and it wasn't actually completely invisible to or invisible to the immune system because we found that when we infected resting cells, we could identify a little bit of HIV protein being expressed. So again, we think this is hopeful. Uh, the big difference between a resting and activated cell turned out to be that an activated cell made so much HIV protein that it made new virions, while those quiescent cells just seemed to make little blips, just a little bit. Somehow they evade the immune system, so that, that problem needs to be overcome. But we took our in vitro model experiments and then decided we would even try to look in patients to see if we could see if HIV proteins were expressed in patients. Um, and you might think, gosh, didn't somebody do this before? Well, the thing is, we, we do see a little bit of HIV protein in patient cells, but it's on the order of one per million. And I'm going to show you that I can see it in four patients, but it's easy to miss one in a million cells. And it was only because we had in vitro modeled and seen so consistently that we could see this, this HIV protein in resting cells that we said, gosh, we have to look really hard. And so we started looking at hundreds of millions of cells and convinced ourselves we could find it. So here I just show you four patients. We've only done this in four patients. Um, and I just show you a high power view. Maybe nobody can see it because of the way the light is. Um, of nuclei, and then I show a view of HIV protein. And basically, in each of these patients, on the order of one per million cells, expressed HIV proteins. Um, and this is preliminary results. Uh, it's, it's currently just presented at meetings. We're, we're going to try to publish it. We still have to prove if this is real. Um, but we found something interesting, which is that we think we understand and one reason why the fact that these cells exist that express HIV proteins has been missed in the past, and that's because we also stained the cells for CD4. And when we did, we found that they were CD4 negative. And so often in studies when they were looking for HIV, they would purify the CD4 cells. We did a series of experiments that I won't show you that suggest that the HIV expression is causing that CD4 downregulation. And so that may be one of the reasons we really didn't realize uh, how predominant, uh, or not how prominent, not prominent, but how, how HIV is actually expressed in vivo. Yes? So what is your marker for quiescent? Sure, we've shown that they're, oh, in this experiment, say it again? Yeah. On this experiment, we just took all the patient cells, we didn't do any purification, and we just put them on a slide. So they're currently, these patients are currently on drugs. And they're on antiretroviral therapy, and we're just asking, can they, can they express any HIV protein? And we're seeing rare ones. And it would take, I thought since it's kind of science, I wasn't going to show you every nitty gritty part. Um, but to say, read my paper, it's coming out. <laughs> but we, we do a lot of experiments to show that the virus causes CD4 downregulation. And in this way, there are rare cells in patients on heart that are expressing HIV proteins. 
And I think this has important implications. Mm. I have another question about your uh, figures that you showed. Yeah. So uh, in the last two donors where there's very low of um, CD4, yes. do you think there's uh, some undergoing this deregulation process? I actually think it's probably just earlier in the stage of CD4 downregulation, but that would need to be proven. So in vitro, we see that there are uh, varying degrees of CD4 downregulation, and we're able to mutate certain HIV proteins and show it doesn't happen. So in our in vitro system, we're very sure. In vivo, we're just getting a snapshot. And I can tell you, you looked closer than I expected, that in patients, we see some that are completely CD4 negative, some that have just a teeny amount, and this one does have a little bit of CD4. So I just wanted to end with um, the implications of our work for HIV cure. The first implication is there is a small fraction of HIV that is expressed even in patients on ARG. So maybe the reservoir isn't completely invisible. Although not, at any point in time, it looks like 0.1%. So this could be completely not relevant. Could be this little bit is going to express, make some virus, and die. It could be this cell is going to turn on and off, and other cells will too. And then maybe it is relevant. Maybe more of the reservoir is clearable than we knew. It will. Um, our, my results also suggest that in vitro models are useful. Um, because without doing our modeling, we would never have searched hundreds of millions of cells to look for CD4 positives, or, or to look for cells that express HIV proteins. And in fact, other studies had said there was none, but they had looked at fewer cells. They had looked on the order of a million and hadn't found them. I, I didn't tell you because I got too excited that we used a special technique called fiber optic uh, array scanning technology to actually look at hundreds of millions of cells. And that's a relatively new technique that's been available for identifying rare cancer cells. Um, and it's basically just a technique that means, you know, in a minute you can scan 20 million cells. And you needed that technique before you could look at this many cells to identify. And we think that technique may be useful as a new tool for HIV. Uh, and finally, I just leave you with what I think is the remaining important question. What controls reservoir visibility? What do we need to do to make more of that reservoir visible? Uh, and we think the tools we're using might help us study that. Uh, so that's all I have, and I can open this up to more questions. Uh, quickly, I just wanted to mention that our last speaker, Dr. O'Doherty, actually postponed a flight in order to give that talk. She was going out of town, so it was great that we could have her.